Got it. <laughs> well, hello and good evening and good morning and good everything, everybody. Welcome to Aquarius Rising Africa again. And it's freezing here where I am. And I want to welcome back again with me this evening, William Steele, who was on, <clears throat> I think it's about a week ago as well, right? Uh, that where we interviewed you the last time, William, which was amazing. Hello, welcome back. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thank you for having me back again. I appreciate it. It's such a pleasure. Wonderful to have you back. Really interesting interview the last, uh, last time uh, when we were chatting about uh, your connection and what some of the stuff you experienced with um, Ghislaine and Jeffrey and definitely super interesting to get more of an inside story on that. And I want to just uh, say to our viewers, if you haven't watched that interview yet, uh, Mornay, who I do believe is in the, uh, the chat, <laughs> will post the link um, of our previous interview just to give you the background on William as well. So what we're going to chat about tonight, William, is your, and as we were just talking <laughs> off air, was uh, more of your prison experiences, because what you told us last week was that you spent 18 years uh, for nonviolent crimes. Uh, you were dealing drugs and stuff like that. And that's really how you got to meet Ghislaine and Jeffrey as well. So your, your path has really been quite an interesting one. So I would love to hear from you. What happened that you got into prison? I mean, 18 years is quite a sentence. So I'd be interested to know what happened that you, were, that you got into prison and tell us some stories about some characters because you really seem to have created quite an interesting life and some interesting experience or, or, or projects for yourself since then as well. It's been a heck of a learning experience for you, but I'd love to hear from the beginning. How did that happen? Talk us through it and give us all the juicy details. <laughs> Okay, well, as we uh, discussed a little bit before, you know, I came from a middle class background in New York City, and uh, I wanted to be this James Bond guy and be able to help people. And uh, um, like watching Mission Impossible, I got into real estate, I got into a uh, school for locksmithing alarms and safes. And I took those experiences after the death of a friend, I tried some cocaine, and I got hooked on coke for a while. And I took my skills with locksmithing and alarms and I used them to do high profile burglaries all across the United States. So I was one of the most prolific jewel and art thieves in the, in the country. And um, in the meantime, because I had a cocaine a problem, I got involved with trafficking cocaine kilos from South Florida to New York and guns, all kinds of firearms. Um, in the midst of all these illegal endeavors that I was involved with, I was, uh, eventually went to prison um, and this last time I was incarcerated, it was 18 years for nonviolent crimes. And so that's how I ended up going to prison. But throughout those oh, years... Okay, I have to ask you this. How did you finally get caught? And how long... Okay, how long were you... And I hear what you're saying, because you obviously had skills in, in locksmithing and alarms. And then you use that and you kind of abuse that power. So you obviously got away with that for a while. How long did you get away with that for? And how did you finally get caught, actually? I'd like to hear that. Mr. Slick. <laughs> well, I got, got away with it on and off for several decades, actually. But there was more than one incarceration. So the stories are usually involving a tail end of a cocaine binge or somebody saying something they shouldn't have said. Um, and, you know, things fell apart from there. And then this last sentence, I actually escaped from prison. I was on America's Most Wanted website. And uh, it wasn't anything fancy, but because of my skills, they were intending to do a whole broadcast about me. Um, and I got caught there when, a, uh, well, two days later, a SWAT team and the U.S. Marshals, everybody, they figured out where I was. They came to storm the place. And when they were knocking, I was a law clerk in prison, so I knew the law. They couldn't come in without my permission, the condominium owner's permission or a search warrant, and they weren't sure I was in there. So I just hid and stayed quiet and waited for them to go away. Like 20, 30 minutes later, they did. 
but they were knocking, you know, U.S. Marshals, you know, we need to speak to you about your house guest. And I was the only one home. So I waited them out. And eventually uh, I got picked up uh, by Daytona Beach. And so the rest is history. I've done all this time. But uh, in prison, I was starting to write my stories. I was fighting. I was working in victim advocacy for a lot of offenders who were wrongfully incarcerated. I was working in the law library. I was working in the chaplain's office. I was assisting the administration. And so guys who couldn't read or write, I was helping them. Now you hear about these innocence projects that help people that are wrongfully incarcerated, but normally they don't have much funding and they can only help the people who have life sentences or death sentence. I was helping everybody who needed it and it just becomes overwhelming, but it's heartbreaking how many innocent people are in prison. Well, I started writing a book about my life and I have a friend who was the editor of the National Enquirer, uh, Gary Greenberg, who's now my co-author on my Sex and the Serial Killer book. So we did this book together. And I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, I can see it. So Gary mm -hmm. Greenberg was my co-author and he was writing a book with me and I was working with an A-list screenwriter writer from Hollywood and she passed away from cancer. So, so we eventually wrote this book because Robert Durst became very heavy in the media. He said, look, don't just write a chapter about Durst, put it out there as, as its own book because it's timely. So we did that. And then uh, Tom Madden, who owns behind me here, Transmedia Group is a, is a big public relations firm. Now, Tom, he was the editor. He was the, uh, Tom was the vice president. I just think I moved that. Tom was the vice president of NBC TV in New York City um, for many years. And now he has Transmedia Group PR firm. And he's just a legend in the industry, in the public relations industry. He's represented everybody from the city of New York. He became such a close friend and mentor and even paid for some of my college courses in prison. And I was writing, I was writing books and I have several more books about to come out. Tom's most recent book about the PR industry and how to get attention for your projects. He calls it the word sign man. Tips for polishing words till they sparkle. So Tom's a wonderful human being. I am filming a TV show now in Indiana based upon my prison you know, release and living with people that you really don't know that well and how it was for me initially getting out of prison. I can't say much more than that, but it'll be on A&E Network on the 18th. And so Tom incredibly even introduced me to my fiance, uh, Dr. Mary Bass. And the prison experience for me was one where I would just avoid all kinds of trouble. I would avoid, you know, I've seen, of course, stabbings and murders and suicides and all the horrible things you hear about. Um, I generally steer clear of any kind of problems. I didn't get involved with any, you know, gambling, using drugs, all the things that get these guys hurt and killed. Um, and there would be other guys, you know, there's a lot of, it's, it's unfortunate, but there's a lot of uh, problems in the prison system, a lot of it's abuse, uh, inmates abusing other inmates. And, you know, so you're around all of that. But in my case, all I did was take college courses. I worked for the administration for the offender representative committee, helping people. So the guy that I became when I was using Coke was gone and, I, and my head was clear. And I wanted to go back to the guy that I was because my mother was mentally ill. And so when I grew up and wanted to be this guy that was defending people, I lost sight of that because of my illegal activities. And so I had a chance to rethink, you know, what I wanted to do with my life. And so, you know, I isn't just, that uh, amazing? Sorry to chime in there. Isn't that amazing how I think prison has such a positive effect on some people as well, because one often hears about these stories um, you know, where people come out of prison and they've really kind of reformed and transformed their lives. So I think there's a there's a blessing in that as well. And I'm I'm really glad that you that you saw the light and you know got got through that. So one of, I'm one of the things, one, carry on, sorry. sorry. One of the things I say is, you know, it's, it's actually I heard it in a movie, I think The Passion of the Christ. You know, the days of darkness has certainly caused me to see the light. I've lost a lot when I was incarcerated. You know, I, my family stole, you know, about $800,000 from me. My mother passed away and I just had this like wake up call. You know what? I want to go back to what I was doing before, you know, being a decent guy, helping people. And, uh, you know, when you say the prison experience changed me, 
it wasn't so much the prison experience because prison does nothing to change a man. If you don't have educational opportunities and some kind of spiritual growth when you're in prison, you're going to go out the same person you went in. And that's my firm opinion because recidivism rates in this country, there's different figures, but recidivism, repeat offending for various reasons is, you know, in the 90th percentile. So it's very rare for somebody to get out and make it even as long as I have right now. But I associated myself with nothing but positive people. If they weren't involved with taking some kind of course or class, and I was helping guys get signed up for these things. I was also a tutor for a while. So I don't say the prison experience in this, not in this country changes anybody. It makes most people worse. I was going to say that because, um, you know, we often hear about people going in and doing these reform programs within prisons. And I know even in South Africa, and we understand the crime rate is really high here. There are definitely some people that go in there and do amazing work within the prison system. And I think that is such a, it's such a worthy cause, you know, because I think there's so many, so many misguided people. And one of the, one of the, the, the ladies in the chat is saying as well, um, lots of innocent people on death row, you know, you hear these things. Um, and, I, and also, especially like here in South Africa, especially in the apartheid era, you know, many innocent people um, <clears throat> ended up on death row when they shouldn't. I'm interested to know, tell us some of your experiences of what you experienced in prison. You know, you must have, I believe God always sends us to these places for a reason. At the time, we don't always see it. But, you know, when we come out, we can have a clearer perspective. And yeah, you are. You know, you've been there, you're out, and you're telling your story. So something, you know, there must have been some quite daunting and haunting experiences for you when you were there. Would you like to share anything with with our viewers as as to how that was for you? What did you experience? Were there any interesting characters, any, anything like that, that you can share with us? I, there was, I, at one point I was in with one of the wealthiest men in the world and his, his name was uh, Krishna Maharaj. And uh, he, he killed, he killed personally several people in Miami over money and the, the, the Mendejean cartel, you know, running cocaine into the United States. So I was with him for a while. Um, many serial killers, murderers, you know, don't forget when I when I was writing this book about Robert Durst, I was writing about a serial killer who, in my view, is the wealthiest serial killer in the, in the in the United States. He's now dead. He was just convicted for killing Susan Berman. So I was writing that book while surrounded by by other serial killers that wouldn't have really took kindly to me exposing you know one of their ilk because the most horrific thing in prison is that how some of these guys they're looking for a kindred spirit, like somebody they can talk to and relate to. So because I knew how to, you know, break into things and you know, open safes and pick locks, they would try to pick my brains and learn something. I said, look, I'm not here to teach anybody anything. I'm not proud of where I'm at. And unless you're involved with something positive, please don't associate with me, you know. But uh, so you'd have guys like, especially the pedophiles, you could always tell who they are. <clears throat> They'd always click together for protection. They were always getting extorted by this gang or that gang. They would always play. There was a, a game they play in prison a lot called Dungeons and Dragons. And almost every time you see guys playing that game, that would usually be the pedophiles playing that game. I don't know why. I don't know what it is about that game in prison, but you'd never see what, that. Get I was, was going to say, what, what does the game entail, Dungeons and Dragons in prison? Do they like chase each other around or what? I have no idea. Some kind of board game. And a lot of Christians say it has like a demonic connection. I don't know. I don't know what's up with this game, but it's a game people even play on the outside. But in prison, it seems to, like if there's a table, you know, or two of guys playing that, every one of them for some reason is the same click. And that's no matter where I've been. I did time in New York, I did time in Florida, you know, Virginia. Is it true? Because we oftentimes hear that if men are arrested for being a pedophile, that they get a really hard time in prison from the other prisoners because what we hear is that um, uh, uh, being a pedophile, the other prisoners really go for you um, in a big way. Is that true? Which I would like to know because it's interesting since there's so many pedophiles who run the world. In New York, they're probably 
kill them or turn them into like a male prostitute or whatever in prison and make them wear a dress and makeup. And if they can get their hands on them, but usually in the York prison system, they'll put them into involuntary protective custody. In other words, they have no choice. You have that kind of charge, a special prison for you. So they could prey on each other. But in other states I've done time, I mean, I've seen them commit suicide. I've seen them gang raped. I've seen them uh, basically turned into women and forced to wear, they, they, they melt down like the, the, the color from an M&M and put like makeup and lipstick on them and make them wear a long t-shirt tied in the side like a woman. And then whoever controls them, whatever, whatever gang or person controls that individual can tell them to go do whatever behind closed doors with anybody for a couple of soups or a few dollars or to pay off a gambling debt. And they're just pimped out and they're abused uh, in a lot of places, uh, you know, something terrible. I don't really have much sympathy for them as a Christian. I do because I'm a human being and I'm a Christian, but at the same time, they're getting the same misery inflicted on them that they've inflicted on their own kids or children or whatever else they've done. So on that level, I can relate to the guys that just exploit them, but uh, it's just a nightmare for everybody. And, you know, I, I steer way clear of those people, period. But the few times they've come to me for legal advice with their case, I'll, you know, go through the motions of helping them, but my heart's not in it to really help somebody who I feel is molested a kid. And not only that, many of them compare notes. Like they'll have pictures of like really young girls, you know, certain facilities even allow new pictures in, some don't, but they'll have the youngest ones they could possibly find. Like, you know, they, supposedly the facility is not letting in the young girl photographs, but you know, you'll see them if even if they're 18, they look like they're 12 with braces on. And these guys, you know, get off on that nonsense. And it's really disgusting. And they're all clicking up, comparing photos and stories about. Are you saying, like so you are actually saying that even though these pedophiles are arrested uh, and they would then obviously go into prison and we understand it's a, it's a weird thing. They kind of attract each other. So they'd form their clique and sometimes even then move to a uh, separate uh, uh, accommodation prison accommodation from the rest of the guys. And while they're actually in there for pedophilia, they are still able to get nude kiddie porn. They are still able to entertain themselves in the same way. Is this because the authorities turn a blind eye or they really don't know? Why, how is that even possible that this that this is still going on within the walls of the prison. Because in reality, nobody cares. There's no, nobody really changing in the prison system unless you're like me and fight for it. And have, <laughs> you know, I lost my family, but I made some incredible contacts outside. And, uh, you know, it's possible because some facilities will allow those photographs in from different companies or magazines. And these guys who are like that, they tend to gravitate towards the youngest ones. And so, it, it goes on. There's no, there's no real change. There was a clerk of one of the buildings and he was uh, uh, advanced degrees and he was doing time for molesting. I think it was his own kids. And he was very much into children. Well, every time his supervisor would leave, he wasn't allowed to use the internet with some guy outside. He was actually getting child porn to the, to the captain who ran the building to the captain's computer and two other staff members suspected what he was doing, never did anything about it. And then he got arrested for more child porn charges in the prison. And they got arrested for letting him use the computer and fired. So this, this goes on because we're not allowed to use computers or internet in prison. But he was a clerk, so they got lazy and had him doing their work for him. But as soon as they turned it back, he would be you know, looking at things he wasn't supposed to be looking at. And somehow he got through all the, he was like a hacker type guy. He got through all these firewalls and protections they have in place. He had an outside friend helping him. And then he got caught. Then there was another pedophile that was working, installing the surveillance cameras around the, the prison. And he would take all the parts and pieces that the, his supervisor, when something was taken down from a prison, was supposed to take it off the prison property. He wasn't doing that. So this guy was putting together mini cameras and power supplies and hiding them in the staff bathrooms and the vents all over the prison. And he was filming staff members and visitors using it. This is a pedophile who had access to surveillance cameras in the prison and arranged to film staff 
and would show it to anybody who wanted to see it. And he got arrested for that. So this, it's just a horrible situation. It's like every man for himself. And I, I steer clear of all that. I, again, hey, my right. I just want to say, sorry, <clears throat> what you were saying earlier about them uh, exploiting these pedophiles and obviously the other gang, gang members or gangs and dressing them as women and putting makeup on them and obviously raping them and doing whatever. You know, how, how is anyone supposed to heal through that? Because my, you know, my experience as well as a healer is knowing that these guys have all been molested as kids anyway. So, we, you know, they, they haven't healed through that trauma, which is why they continue that. So now it's, there's no healing, there's no counseling, there's no way that these guys even get to, from what you're saying to me, get an opportunity of reforming that kind of stuff. And I mean, it's, so they come out even worse. I can some, imagine. Some, this. some prisons, they do have a program. For example, one of them was, I think, called the SOAP program, Sex Offender Abuse Program. And they would give them a binder to walk around with a blue binder that they had to be a class at a certain time. And what the facility did by giving them that blue binder and they all had to be at a certain place at a certain time, it put a target on the guys that were trying to lay low about it. It actually made them more of a target. So this is, this is how they don't think things through and they expose these guys to more abuse by putting a label on them and having them carry around a blue folder around a prison where you're not allowed to carry anything unless it's a Bible or some legal work. <laughs> so it's just, uh, they, this is what happens. And Again, I got through it by helping people where I could with programs, with signing up for ministry activities and college courses or GED, um, you know, general equivalency diploma, we call it here. And I had good mentors in my life. Now, Tom, while I was in prison, the COVID pandemic hit. People were dying all around me. And I was desperately trying to get out. And his, uh, uh, his friend, who is now a very good friend of mine, and my mentor was Peter Tickton. He's an attorney in, uh, in Palm Beach County. And Peter Tickton was friends, went to military caddy with Donald Trump. And so this man on his own started trying to petition to get me out a few months early to just try not to die from COVID. And Peter wrote this book about Peter Tickton, about Donald Trump. Okay. What Makes Trump Tick by Peter Tickton. And so Peter really became a mentor of mine and, uh, well, along with Tom. So I was blessed in that what I was trying to do was shed light on the problems with the criminal justice system. And then my life growing up with a mentally ill parent and my substance abuse problem and just really opened people's eyes. And now I'm getting invited to speak at universities, churches, uh, different outlets. And now I have a TV show about my experiences getting out of prison. So it's really overwhelming. And I'm very glad to have met you to have me on the show because I'm surprised that I'm actually getting a lot of interest from South Africa and Australia <laughs> and especially England, because I knew Ghislaine Maxwell, as you know, I had a brief relationship with her and some crazy stuff happened at the Palm Beach mansion. Uh, I'm in Florida now. We expect the film over there tomorrow. But uh, I, I wrote about her, you know, at the encouragement of everybody who said, look, don't just write those as a footnote in your book. It's too important. In my life story book, my, my Christian testimony make them their own books for now. And then later you can include them as a footnote in your other book. So that's why these two books came out first, but there's other ones going to be released soon. What inspired you to write the book on, I think it's called Sex and the Serial Killer. I'd be interested to know. And especially um, while you, you were saying earlier on, while you were in prison, you were obviously surrounded. You were writing this book along with your co-author as well. And you were surrounded by a whole lot of, uh, I was about to say pedophiles, but uh, serial killers, which I suppose are synonymous, really. Um, I'd be interested to know what your experience of those guys were. What did you understand about the, the serial killers? What was there? I mean, you, you, you've got a crime channel as well. I've got a real fascination for the human mind and, the, and, and understanding all of these things. So for, for someone like myself, it's very interesting to speak to you that has been surrounded by that. And as you say, actually uh, written a book on that, 
does crime investigations, it's very interesting for me uh, to hear what you have to say about the serial killers that you uh, were surrounded with. Maybe you can tell us, were there any that we would know about? Uh, who did you, did you speak to them? Did you engage? Did you have any interaction with them? Aside how coward, how cowardly the pedophiles are in prison and, and in the world, um, the probably the other group of cowards are serial killers of women. Most of them are nothing but cowards when it comes to prison, prison life. They stay to themselves. They generally have a genre of, of individual that they kill, which is mostly going to be women for some reason. I don't know the psychology behind it. People brighter than me can't figure it out. So how, what were they like? A lot of the serial killers are resigned to their fate. They're in there thinking that their reputation for killing people will keep them safe in prison. But most of us know that they only kill women and they're freaking cowards when it comes to dealing with somebody with a head on their shoulders or a man. And so they just kind of walk on eggshells and they think their reputation is enough to scare people. But the dangerous ones in prisons are not even them. The dangerous ones in prison are the guy who in a rage kills somebody like a girlfriend or a friend or a family member. Those guys are still dangerous. They still have that short fuse in prison. And if you get on those guys' bad side or on a gang's bad side, you could easily end up suddenly killed in prison. Some of the mentally ill people are not being properly treated in prison. Also suddenly snap and kill people. We had a guy in a jail in New York. Uh, they called him the general. Big, huge guy was bullying everybody around and uh, would just be so abusive to everybody, especially if you were a different race than him. There's a lot of racial you know, problems in the prisons as well. So he would run the blacks against the whites and this and that. And I'm from the city, so I knew a lot of people. Well, I'm not going to go into that right now. So not too many people would mess with me because I can handle myself. I can stay away from situations. I don't provoke these guys at all, you know, because they're, they're short fuse and then they, then they target you. And you can't show any fear. You know, even if you do have concerns, you better not show it because they, they're like, it's like, almost like animals, a lot of the guys in prison. They're just pure predators. They, they, they sense fear. And uh, so you can't show it even if you're feeling it. Um, so this particular guy, not only was he running a crew of extortionists, he was raping another inmate, uh, um, another uh, mentally ill black young man, and on a regular basis. And that guy was so afraid of this big, huge guy that I was sleeping in my cell. And right in front of my cell, there was another sleeping prisoner because it was overcrowded. He was sleeping on like a mat. And no, it was like an elevated mat and uh, on a little rack thing. And so this, this other guy was pacing, telling people he was seeing purple flames, the guy who had been getting raped by the gigantic dude. And finally, he just freaked out right in front of my cell and started kicking that guy in the head, a sleeping guy in the head, and through the bars, drove his head through the bars, and all you saw was brains and blood falling out all over the place. He killed the guy in his sleep because he was in such a perpetual rage from being raped every day by the other guy. So things like this happen every day. That happened in front of me. Um, there was another one where a guy thought somebody told on him on something petty, you know, snitched on him. They're all snitches. Every, every one of them is telling on something. So don't, don't believe all that, you know, there's no snitches in prison. Every one of them, including the gang leaders, are telling on each other. So he gets a locker, you know, it's probably weighs 150 pounds full of paperwork and, and, and food items, picks a locker up. He's, he's thinks this guy told on him for something. And when the guy's sleeping, in the dormitory, dropped it on his head and crushed his skull. So this is some of the things that happened in front of me. It's just it's horrible, horrible experiences. Um, I thought I had post-traumatic stress from what Ghislaine Maxwell did to me. <laughs> but so I think worse traumatic stress for me was seeing some of these murders in prison right in front of me. That's uh, pretty graphic, you know. And I, wow, that must be crazy. You know, I can imagine... I know I've I've watched a few prison movies. Uh, one one I must say that I watched a few episodes of Oz. I think it was called Oz, particularly particularly brutal of the uh, prison life. So I can imagine that seeing stuff like that must be very traumatic, and yeah. um, can't have been enjoyable. How how did you protect yourself? I mean, did you have any experiences with any of these guys? Um, how were you able to protect I, yourself? I, by my wits, my intelligence, my street smarts, just outwitting them. 
And plus, I was a law clerk. So usually when a guy is a law clerk and knows the law, you're very valuable in prison because I might be helping a member. I'm not going to name gang members on here to give them any props, but you might be helping a member of this gang to get back to court or to get his dental work done, helping them fill out the paperwork because a lot of these guys are illiterate. So I help everybody because that's what God put on my heart to do, try to help people. And so I'll help everybody, but usually it's from conflicting gangs. And if anybody even thought about, like if I was at chapel service or a college course, thought about going to my cell and stealing something, the gangs would usually say, oh no, they called me New York. Oh no, leave New York alone. He's good, he's good, he helps everybody. <laughs> so just from making yourself useful, you were pretty much off limits, you know? So, okay. I learned, yeah. but I did, I did have a problem one time. I went into that same unit I told you about. This is New York. New York's super violent. And I was get, I got sentenced. I was going to prison for three years. And some guys, just random guys, I guess they was, were a gang, tried to extort me. And I, was, and I called my attorney. I said, look, get, call the commander. Get me off this floor until I leave. So they called me out. They said, look, you're going to be moved to another unit tomorrow. We understand that's a bad unit. It was super racially charged that every single white person that went in that unit was assaulted. And I was like, well, great. I'm in the unit where it's like, it's known for that guys get taken out on stretchers on a regular basis. And I guess they got wind that I was trying to get moved. And one of them came to my cell to argue with me about it. And I went to shut the door and lock myself in. He grabbed it out of my hand and locked it backwards. And then I got jumped by like eight people and I woke up in the hospital. So I had all the bones in my face broken over here. I almost lost my eye. I had three broken ribs. And so they beat me up. Then they jumped over me and they went and stole everything in my, in my cell. You know, so just for, just for like $30 in commissary, they about killed somebody. So that was a long time ago. That was my first, you know, I like, think it was in 1988 or something. It was a long time ago. But uh, so I have since learned just to leave them alone. Don't talk to them. Don't hang out with them. If they come to me for help, you try to see if you can help them. But it's completely pointless to try to rationalize with many of the guys in prison that are extremely violent and irrational and or so afraid they're doing violence on behalf of other gang leaders. So they don't even know what they're getting themselves into because when the, sh when the shit hits the fan, their own leader is going to tell on them and they're going to take the fall. And their leader is going to be laughing all the way to the next, to the next thing. So, I know that the trailer for your new TV pro show has recently come out. Are you at liberty to speak about it with us at this point yet? I have a meeting with the network executives tomorrow, actually, and they'll give me some guidelines. They, they gave me some few, a few. Obviously, I can't discuss any uh, spoilers. I can't discuss what's in the episodes, but in a general sense from their press release, um, you'll see the press release and the trailer on official William Steele, which is my YouTube, and I think you're going to have it in your description. Um, so yeah. please subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. I'm trying to build up subscribers. Official William Steele on YouTube and Instagram. Um, but you'll see that uh, one, of the, one of the things, you know, I can't talk about the trailers, the spoilers, and I forgot what else I was about to say about that. What else wasn't I allowed to talk about? Other cast oh, members, you know, okay. in, any, in any detail. Um, because they, of course, they want people to watch it, but it airs on the 18th on A and E Network. Can we talk about the concept? What the concept is? Oh, just yeah, to maybe just... Right. So the concept is really tracking recidivism rates in the United States. They've proven that aside from alcoholism and drug addiction being reasons for people to return to prison to reoffend, um, the way that they hold recidiv they they connected recidivism and high recidivism rates to a lack of adequate housing upon release. Now, in my case, I could have went back to family in New York or South Florida, but they stole $800,000 from me and I wasn't prepared to deal with all that drama. I wanted to start my life fresh. So in my case, I was writing a lady and her husband in Indiana for years. Um, they were a branch of Christianity I don't ascribe to. And I said, look, you know the situation with my family, I'm getting out soon. Until I get on my feet and can move back down to South Florida, you mind if I go to Indiana for a few months? Can I, you know? And they discussed it. They said, "Sure, you're welcome." And I said, "Please understand, I don't. I'm not going to join your branch of Christianity. I just say I'm a Christian. I'm not going to join any particular religion." That was the understanding, and that all changed when I moved in, and it became a very difficult situation. 
So bottom line, now Mary's moved out there, my fiance from California, and things are going great. I'm here in Florida now and doing many interviews, of course. I'm here for 10 days, but we're actually trying to line up uh, other things to do and, and uh, going forward. But uh, Indiana was nice. The people there are lovely. Uh, we met a, we met a uh, prolific swindler there, Charles Ray Smith. Who, he's looking at 120 years, you know, right now. The FBI arrested him. He tried to sell us a house he didn't own. He tried to sell us, uh, Mary was diagnosed with leukemia, tried to sell us a fake cure for leukemia. Uh, she's in remission now. And so he's been sued for this before. He's been, and he's one of the wealthiest people in that town and nobody could bring him down. And I said, you know what? I'm not leaving town until we help bring him down. And that's what we did as part of our crime victim advocacy. I can't go into a lot of details of how that played out, but that's coming out too. And there'll probably be a, uh, another drama series or something done on that whole story. Um, so now here I've connected with a, a philanthropist and this is down in South Florida. His name is a J James at Massian. He's a real estate developer. He's a, he's a gentleman. And this guy is uh, incredible. What he does for the homeless and for people that are coming out of prison and the mentally ill as he provides homes and, and uh, opportunities for them through, through this nonprofit is called Changing Lives. Now, Changing Lives, I went and sat on, in on their board meeting yesterday with him. And so I told them, I said, look, wherever I can fit in, involve me. And if it's a paid position, great. If it's not, I'll be glad to volunteer and because he's doing some wonderful things here in this town. And uh, it was really a privilege to uh, spend some time with him and a bunch of these other executives. I mean, they literally let me into this meeting that's generally a closed meeting and let me in and, you know, place of honor basically right beside this guy who's a legend in this town. And he's just done nothing but go out of his way to help people. And actually, Tom and Gary are the ones that introduced me to him. So James Batmassian, Changing Life's Ministry in, uh, in, in South Florida and Boca Raton. I just had incredible, I'm just blessed. I, I pray for things and God doesn't necessarily give me exactly what I ask for, but he always answers my prayers. Absolutely. And that's how, it's, that's how it's been for me. I pray for, a, I was scared. I was like, Lord, I'm like really lonely in prison. You know, I want to meet somebody when I get out. But then it's COVID. How am I going to meet anybody? I don't know anything about the internet. And so I don't know how to do that. And then how do you meet people in person if you can't get out and about? You know, you're not allowed or you can't or people are not coming out. You don't want to get sick. Well, Tom introduced me to Mary and because she was, you know, had a client in California and needed a PR firm. We hit it off. And three months before my release, I'm in love. I'm engaged shortly thereafter. And she knew nothing about the TV show or my, you know, any of my success. She, we just have a thing for victim advocacy. And so she's super intelligent. She got into a top university at 15 years old. And, uh, you know, she's just everything I prayed for. Somebody who believes in God like I do. Um, she's just a real strong faith in God. And I said, I, that's all I wanted. I want a woman who was intelligent and had a good faith in God. When I saw how beautiful she was, it was like icing on the cake. <laughs> <laughs> the added bonus. Oh, William, that is so awesome. I'm so you'll see her, you'll see her in some of my interviews on uh, official William Steele. So. Yeah. Well, we'd we'd like to have her join you for one of your next ones. Actually, that could that could be fun as well. But it's really good to see that that you know I really enjoy listening to these stories with with people like yourself. You know that have gone into these situations. Um, at the time, you don't understand why it's probably hell to go through all of that. But, you know, to come out at the end of the day and to pay it forward in the way that you ha that you are. And, you know, you have, you've had your mentors have helped you. And, yeah, you are because prison, wow, I, I, I have not spent a minute there. And, and I, I, I hope to God that I don't ever. But I, I know that, that it's, it's, it, it, for people in there, in that situation, what they need is healing. What they need is kindness. What they need is compassion. I don't care what they've done. I mean, it's not up to me to decide if they're redeemable in God's eyes or not. You know, at the end of the day, we're human beings. We've all erred. Um, and that's what we need to understand about these people in prison as well. So I'm really actually looking forward to your TV series so that we can see, and I would, I'd love to see, so excited for that as well. So but, I, feel, um, 
I'd like, I'd like to add, if I could, I didn't uh, interrupt your, 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 your thing. I really, really critically important for me to, to mention, you know, my mentors as I did throughout the show. Thank you for everybody for bearing with me. And the first one I really came into my life was the editor of the National Enquirer. He was on a jury where I testified for the defense when a young man was being framed for murder. And I knew that the other guy was framing him and I took the stand for the defense. And this editor from the National Enquirer was the jury foreman. Well, after that trial, of course, they acquitted the kid. We stayed in touch after the trial, me and the jury foreman. And that's who wrote the book Sex and the Serial Killer with me, Gary Greenberg. And he's also put this one out now because he's really into health. <laughs> well, it's how to, drink, how to drink beer and not lose weight. And he's making it work. you got to see this guy. He plays rugby and he's like, I want to tease him and say he's 105, but uh, he's probably about, I don't know, 55 or something, 60. But so that's my buddy, Gary. And, and, and we talked about the prison experience for me it was a matter of mentors. Guys in prison or the family members should not be afraid to reach out because you'd be surprised how many people have alcoholism, drug addiction or suicides and mental illness in their families. And it's a st stark secret. Everybody's distressed because they don't know how to deal with it. But you reach out, you'd be surprised how many, you know, people out there that are, you know, living life on its terms that are willing to reach in and help you. And now that I've been through it, I think that's my obligation now to reach back and try to help people going through it. And that is such a wonderful way to live your life. And I think that is so awesome. So I say thank you for that because, you know, we never understand. It's so easy to judge people um, uh, who are in prisons and stuff like that. We have no, and this is this to me again, we have no, when we judge others for things that we deem them to do wrong, such as prisoners, for example, like yourself, because you were this big criminal and deserve to be there according to the general public, no doubt. Yeah. But we have no idea what your sacred agreement with God is. And only now, 20 years later, is that clear to you? So I love that. And that is why I think this is such a shining example for others who are going through bad times. You know, my situation was as well, my fiance was killed in hijacking. And that was the thing that got me to do the work I do today. So I'm through sorry, all sorry that- to hear, I'm Sorry to hear that. I didn't realize thank that. you so much. I appreciate that. I really do. Thank you. But that was the thing that triggered me to heal, to understand pain and to turn it into something that is healing and to understand it and, and to use it for the benefit of others as well. So I think, you know, I, I resonate with that very much. And I think it's really cool that you've done what you've done. Again, I, you know, we've been speaking a lot on this channel lately about non-judgment and stuff like that. So it is so important when we hear your story to realize that we should never judge another ever here you are doing this incredible work you've been to hell and back because really you know even as much as what we work with the, let's say the sra survivors who've been satanically ritually abused that's there that's one kind of hell i mean what you just one or two of your experiences that you've explained to us here this evening as well that is another kind of hell to see that kind of brutality right in front of you i think it must scar a person for a long time and to use that for the benefit of others is a very honorable thing to do. So I want to say thank you. I was actually going to carry on to the next line of questioning and other stuff that we had, but I'm going to leave that for next time then because I see we <laughs> time has flowed as usual. Listen, listen, I'll be back anytime you want to hear from me. And if your followers want to subscribe to Official William Steele, I'd be grateful. Um, hopefully, buy my books. I'm trying to earn an honest living these days. <laughs> so. <laughs> we'll help you. We definitely, we're all about that. So, you know, we'll come to you the so light side. <laughs> it's, been, it's been blessed to, um, to meet you and, you know, and everybody here is thrilled that I'm doing shows overseas too. So, <laughs> and Likewise, thank you so much for, for joining us, William. And, right. and Mary as well. I know that uh, we're going to convince her to come on one of these days as well. And we can talk a little bit about what you guys are doing together because you're doing some great stuff. Um, but we definitely we're going to catch up with you next week again. 
and we will look at um, all, sorts of, all, all sorts of other details and really look forward to catching your TV show. So all the links to William's channels, his uh, 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 Instagram, YouTube, whatever we have, whatever Mona has, Mona has all the details. He's going to he's gonna post in the description box. Um, and so, yeah, find us on Facebook. And by the way, we did a really cool short five-minute um, snippet of the last interview we did with you. So also just to the viewers, if you guys just want to, catch a five minute snippet of our interview with video uh, with with William and maybe share that as well because that's a really cool but it's on our Facebook page both of them it's on Aquarius Rising Africa it's on solutions it's on our Twitter page as well so go and look at that um Mona is doing great stuff with that as well just getting a little uh five minute uh snippets of our interviews out there which I think was really amazing so Awesome, guys and girls. If you haven't already, please give us a like, a share, and a subscribe. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, Telegram, Rumble. We're getting more and more over to Rumble now. So please find us on Rumble as well because we're going to, you know, the minute we get an interview that might be slightly dodgy, we're going to just send it over to Rumble because YouTube has got their beady eyes on us in a major way. Um, so anyway, I don't know, William, is there anything you'd like to share or say just in closing before we end off today's chat? I'm just very grateful for all the goodwill that I'm being shown since uh, my release because, you know, when you're in prison, you don't, it's, you start to think nobody cares, you know, and now I'm seeing people do it. I'm very grateful. We're very Thank grateful you. to you. And I'm so, I'm so, I'm so I feel so grateful to our viewers as well because you know I I I always watch the comments in our in our videos and there were so many amazing comments from our viewers on this channel. And guys, thank you for that. You know, it's just yeah. amazing to, to see our viewers supporting uh, uh you, William. I mean, we have mm. lots of amazing guests on this channel. You are definitely one of them, and it's wonderful to see our viewers support you and embrace you as well. So I want to say thank you, guys. Thank it's you, not everybody. Easy. Yeah, I can imagine coming out of prison after 18 years <laughs> and suddenly being in this huge world and with yeah. all these stories going on, you've, it's, it, can, it can be a bit daunting, I would imagine. Keep in mind, social media didn't even exist when I went in, nor did a smartphone, and now I have to use them all day long. <laughs> so I'm really uh, confused and, and you know my thanks to Mary for having the patience to keep explaining it to me over and over again <laughs> well us ladies have patience we're born yeah. with that so you're lucky to have a wonderful woman in your life as well okay guys thank you so much for joining us this evening uh, send you lots of love Mwah. God bless you all and we'll see you very very soon again